sorry for the silence, everyone. Still mastering figuring out music that actually plays correctly. So thank you for your Zen moment before we get into get into everything. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I feel like maybe I should have like led a breathing exercise. The silence was uh, good, if not awkward. <laughs> um, so uh, let's get into it. Hello. My name is Kate Rubin. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the organizing director at B Seattle. Tonight's Building Tenant Power Workshop um, is about universal design and disabled renters' rights. We have some really great speakers tonight. Uh, Fatima uh, Ori from the Kelsey, Carly Hokey from the Northwest Universal Design Council, and Shane Warner from the Tenant Um, I'm going to start us off with a land acknowledgement. We are on the land of the Coast Salish peoples. I would like to recognize that we are occupying the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. As we do this important work on these lands, we understand that our collective liberation cannot happen without indigenous sovereignty. We encourage each of you to sign the petition for federal recognition of the Duwamish tribe. And if you're able, visit the longhouse and pay rent to the Duwamish. You can learn more about this from Real Rent Duwamish. We'll include a link for them in the resource guide that we'll send after the presentation and we'll drop a copy in the chat. Our resource guide also contains contact information for the Renting in Seattle Helpline, the Department of Construction and Inspections, also known as SDCI. They're responsible for enforcing landlord tenant laws, um, the Seattle Office for Civil Rights, as well as a bunch of other organizations that provide services to renters. We encourage you to get more involved with B Seattle. We're seeking table volunteers, flyer friends, um, and people interested in developing their skills as part of a tenant leadership team. We host two renter council meetings every month, the Elder Renter Council, which centers renters age 50 plus, and the Seattle Renter Organizing Council. These councils were created for renters to work together to strategize and fight for renter protections that they feel are important to their communities, uh, to give and receive peer-to-peer -peer support for folks organizing in their buildings, grow renter power and build community. We'll drop links to sign up for the email lists in the chat. So um, before we get into the bulk of our event, we're going to share some upcoming community events that we think you should be aware of. Um, Friday, October 27th at 10 a.m. at Seattle City Hall or remotely, um, there's a chance to give public comment for the Seattle City budget. So this is your chance uh, to advocate for what you want the city to spend funds on in 2024. Um, budget advocacy is like not that interesting to most people, but it's so important if you want anything to get done through the city. Um, so if you want organizations like B Seattle to continue to put on workshops um, and hosting rental renter councils and help with building organizing, or if you want the city to support uh, creation of a tenant work group to study an office, to create an office of rental housing standards, um, let the city know. So come to city hall in person or give public comment um, online. Well, sign up online and call into the meeting. The online sign up sheet will open at 8 a.m. Um, and I just wanna let folks know that uh, through the public comment at the last budget hearing, um, council member, the budget chair, council member Mosqueda, put uh, $50,000 into the balancing package um, for a tenant work group to work on the uh, Office of Rental Housing Standards. Um, she said it was through advocacy and hearing about that at public comment that made her do that. So um, this is a really important time to uh, get your, your feelings heard uh, around the budget. 
uh, Friday, October 27th at 7 p.m. at the Northwest Film Festival. Uh, the Dis Disabled List, it's produced by local comedians Dan Hurwitz and Kayla Brown. Um, this is an event that takes place bi-monthly. Um, and the live comedy show features Brown, Hurwitz, and an ever-changing cast of local comedians. In this edition, Michael Bellevue, um, volunteer for B Seattle, uh, Laura Lyons, Greta Gimp, and special guests. This event it features automated captioning with voice recognition projected onto the screen. When you register, please let the Northwest Film Forum know if you have any accessibility needs. With enough advance notice, they will do their best to accommodate. Uh, and if for any reason they're unable to accommodate you, they'll reach out prior to the showtime. Masks are required. Event. Um, I went to our, the last one, super fun. Uh, so highly recommend. Sunday, October 29th, 2 to 6 p.m. at Calendar Sim Park. A Will in a Way, Seattle presents a very scary mutual aid fair. There will be food, games, music, zines, and more. Costumes are strongly encouraged. Uh, Thursday, November 2nd, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, got questions about your rights as a worker? Need help navigating a situation at work? Uh, join Queer Power Alliance for Power Up to learn about how you're protected. And Sunday, November 5th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, at University Heights Center. It's the warm uh, winter drive. Every year, U Heights partners with various community organizations to provide warm essentials to our low-income and unhoused communities during the frigid winter weather. This annual initiative aims to distribute basic supplies such as coats, hats, gloves, and blankets to equip those most vulnerable throughout the season. There will be resource booths, mobile clinics, free haircuts, and more. Uh, Tuesday, November 7th, it's voting day. So um, make sure to turn in your ballots at a ballot box no later than 8 p.m. Uh, if you check the stranger today, uh, there's actually a quote from uh, my co-director, Tanya, about what Seattle could look like with a council full of conservatives. Um, so consider that when you vote. Um, so if you want to check your registration status or you have questions about the elections or you need to find a ballot box, um, we've got some resources, which we'll drop in the chat. Thursday, November 9th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at El Centro de la Raza in room 311, which is the Roberto Maestras Digital Literacy Lab, or online via Zoom, is the next member next meeting of the Seattle Renter Organizing Council. So we'll uh, talk updates about the uh, Office of Rental Housing Standards, which we've been organizing around, um, plan for upcoming up, up public pu public comment opportunities, um, and we'll figure out next steps for our group. So uh, newcomers are always welcome. And if you come in person, we'll have dinner provided. Saturday, November 11th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at New Holly Gathering Hall. It's the Health and Wellness Festival. Um, this is hosted by the Community Health Board Coalition. There will be help with health insurance enrollment, uh, health screenings, various vaccines, food and activities, including a performance for the youth-focused Robom and Plum program, Kemmer Armorick uh, Performing Arts. Monday, November 13th, 10 a.m. at Seattle City Hall. Uh, it's another opportunity to give comment on the Seattle City budget. And then uh, finally, Monday, November 13th at 5 p.m., also at City Hall, it's the final public hearing for the Seattle City Budget. Um, the public hearings are when everyone gets an opportunity to speak, so the time isn't, your time to speak is limited, but everyone gets a chance versus at the meeting, sometimes it is limited. Um, so at the last uh, budget hearing, we all got together early, met for coffee, planned our comments together um, and we were really successful. So we'll probably do that again. If you are signed up for our Seattle Renter Organizing Council or Elder Renter Council email lists, we'll send you an email um, about the details on, on how to do that. So we can all get together and uh, use our voices to uh, uplift our, our, our needs as community. Uh, Wednesday, November 15th, 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, location to be determined. 
or online via Zoom. It's the next Elder Renter Council meeting. We have been having trouble getting our, our regular library location. So uh, we are researching alternative locations because the library that we used to reserve has not been available for months now. Um, and folks didn't really like the backup libraries. Uh, Thursday, November 16th, 5.30 to 7 p.m. at 800 Hiawatha Place South. Um, it's the How's Our Neighbors launch party. In February 2023, the How's Our Neighbors Coalition passed Initiative 135, creating the first voter-approved social housing developer in the United States. Uh, to fully focus on these exciting challenges and the next steps, in August 2023, uh, they incorporated How's Our Neighbors as a standalone 501c4. So this event is the kickoff of the Han Coalition becoming an independent entity. Come celebrate the past work of the Han Coalition and get energized about what's to come. Saturday, November 18th, 6 to 9 p.m. at Metropolis, uh, 350 Seattle presents Intertwined 2023. 350 Seattle is celebrating their 10th anniversary with a lively event filled with music, fun, and a shared feast. The organization has a lot to commemorate, uh, commemorate and invites friends and neighbors to join them on November 18th for their annual dinner and fundraising celebration. The occasion will provide an opportunity to applaud the hard work and achievements of their resilient community, as well as the past remarkable grassroots momentum they have generated over the past year and throughout the past decade. Registration information will be made available soon. Wednesday, November 22nd, 6 to 8 p.m. It's B Seattle's November Building Tenant Tower Tenant Power Workshop. Sorry. Um, it's going to be a Know Your Renters Rights training. And we'll talk about uh, when your landlord is required to notify you of a rent increase, what to do if your landlord isn't making repairs, who qualifies for economic displacement relocation assistance, and more. Um, so go ahead and register for that. And we know it's the night before Thanksgiving, um, but it'll be worth tuning in. Uh, Wednesday, November 29th at 6.30 p.m. at Southside Commons. It's a uh, space boldly going where writers face injustice. For 11 years, the Transit Writers Union has been a voice fighting for working people in Seattle and King County. True members are making change in our communities. They are focused on access, accessibility, affordability, and accountability. There's so much to celebrate from their work to raise the wage, their bus rider advocacy, their solidarity fund, their work with the Mass Coalition and the Stay House, Stay Healthy Coalition. Now is the time to come together as a community and ensure the fights, ensure the fights still to come have the resources that they need for success. Oh my gosh, that was a long time. Uh, many events, so get excited. And I'm going to pass the proverbial mic over to my co-director, Tanya Moore, to introduce our speakers. All right, thank you so much. Um, we are so excited to have you all here and our amazing speakers. Our first speaker today is Fatima Ori. Um, she, her pronouns, she is the director of field capacity building and capacity at the Kelsey with a communications degree from Northwestern University and a public policy master's from UC Berkeley. She leads the Kelsey's efforts to grow the field of leaders, advocates, and champions of disability forward housing solutions. She dreams of a day when affordable, accessible, and inclusive housing is a given for any new developments. She is fueled by the Kelsey's commitment to co-lead the movement by people with and without disabilities. She uses the cane for balance and coordination stemming from a neurological movement condition born and raised in San Francisco, but now an Oakland resident with her husband, Seth, and her dog, Duke Ellington. That's my favorite part right there. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna quit sharing and she's gonna share her screen and it is all yours. Thank you so much. Let me just... Uh, um... Okay, thumbs up if you can see my screen. Okay. Um, hold on. Let me... 
Okay. Um, hi, that was a great um, reading of my bio. Um, like Tanya said, my name is Fatima Ori, and I'm the Director of Field Building and Capacity at the Kelsey. And I'm here to give you just an introduction to our inclusive design standards. Um, hold on. So a little bit about the Kelsey. We are a nonprofit who pioneered disability forward housing solutions that open doors to homes and opportunities for everyone. And you might be asking yourself, what does disability forward even mean? And to me, it means keeping disability at the forefront at all times um, and making sure that everything that we do is underscored by the fact that we seek to be disability forward. Um, So just to ground the conversation, to give you some context for the problem, we have some statistics. Whereas one, about one in four people in the US have some sort of dis disability, only less than 6% of the available housing stock in the US is even accessible to people with mobility or sensory disabilities. And 11% of people with disabilities who use supportive services either rent or own their own home. So this is just to give you a flavor of how people with disabilities continue to not have their housing needs met. Um, a little bit, okay. So our design standards include over 300 elements. So I have the book here. This is the actual physical copy. Um, and these elements can include design choices, building features, development strategies, and operational policies. And these screenshots are just to give you a flavor of what the inside of the standards looks like. So I can go on and on about the standards, but I'll give four highlights. So the first is that we wanted the standards to be cross disability, which just means that they address a broad and diverse set of needs of people with disabilities. And I'll talk more about this later. They are also multi-dimensional, which means that they address many elements of housing development from design all the way to operations. The design standards are implementable and expandable, meaning that they can clearly and swiftly be adopted, but also they evolve and expand over time. And last but not least, uh, the design standards are about value creation. We feel very strongly at the Kelsey that disability forward design supports better, more efficient, more equitable building development. And a little bit about what the design standards are not, they are not a code requirement. Rather, they are designed to work alongside code. Um, and another thing that we impress upon architects and developers and builders is that the ADA has given us 
a, a floor, not a ceiling. So you'll often hear developers say, oh, well, this is just what we need to do so we don't get sued. And we're all about encouraging people to go far beyond that. ABA has given us some tools, yes, but that is not the end of it. You can go above and beyond what ADA says. Um, so the second thing, these are not a replacement for engaging individuals with lived experience in your community. Luckily, the design standards include uh, requirements and strategies to do just that. And lastly, the design standards are in no way complete. This is the first edition and we have revision planned for the end of this year. So um, if you can download them and read through them, um, your feedback is invaluable. So um, that's how we're going to improve the design standards and make them better based on your feedback and your insights and your edits. Um, I love this slide because it's a great reminder of when the design standards were first a thing. So I don't know how many of you know the Bay Area, but we have two developments in progress, one in San Jose, California, and the other in San Francisco. And I remember our CEO, her name is Michaela Connery. Um, she was frustrated by the fact that it was like an, reinventing the wheel with every single project. And so she said to herself out loud, wouldn't it be great if we had a set of strategies and tools that go beyond code to support cross-disability access and inclusion and just have that set ready to go so that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel and do the exact same thing in every place that we were developing. And this was like the first moment that design standards entered um, our minds as a thing that could actually be. So um, a little bit about um, who we credit um, with the design standard, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, it says the Kelsey in partnership with McKinnon Architecture. And we continue to work very closely with Eric McKinnon, who owns McKinnon Architecture. And he is a wheelchair writer and a hearing aid user. So his lived experience, both as a person with disabilities and as an architect, were invaluable to us. We also have the Inclusive Design Council, which is made up of 10 um, professionals, all with disabilities across the nation. And um, we use them for feedback and as a sounding board throughout the process. And finally, designer partners. We had numerous workshops and one-on-one -on -one consultations with architects who are working on multifamily, affordable and accessible housing. So that is the who. The what and how is really this process. When we started off, we had over 800 elements. And so as not to make this a phone book, we knew that we had to whittle it down. So we got it down to about 300 and I'll go into design categories, impact areas and additional benefits 
which is the way that we chose to kind of organize the information. And finally, we, we compiled everything and published on our website, which again is free and open source. So anyone can go to our website and um, either download the PDF or we have a, an Excel version for self-certification if you're interested in that. But um, like I said, we're on the first edition and we haven't released the second edition yet. So design categories really, um, Eric Mickenden actually made this slide and it's important to break up the process, the location, and the actual building. So I'm not going to steal this from him. This is uh, something that Eric says often, which is if you want an inclusive project, you need to start with an inclusive process. And at the very beginning of the process is um, design and it ends with operations and amenities and process just means kind of laying out the step-by-step -step that you need to go through in order to have a truly disability forward um, process. Next, location and site selection is really important because we want to make sure people are near grocery stores, banks, public transit. Um, because I'm not sure if you know, but people with disabilities experience poverty at a higher rate than most people in our society. So uh, selecting a site that is um, near all of these amenities is very important. And then um, building features. We have building components, interior spaces, and dwelling units. So the dwelling units are where people actually live. Interior spaces would be like the lobby or a community room or a laundry room with washer dryers. And building components is really about, an example would be like uh, setting the lighting levels for the um, interior spaces or, um, you know, making sure that hammer so that people can, um, regardless of their height, access uh, handrails in the most safe way possible. So again, this is how uh, we have designed this, uh, designed and organized the standards. So every circle that you see represents a different section of the design standards. Another way that we have organized is impact areas. And impact area um, is kind of another term for access need. And rather than a type of disability or a diagnosis, um, these different impact areas link to access needs that different design or program choices can support. And quickly, these include mobility and height, hearing and acoustics, vision, health and wellness, cognitive access, and support needs. Another thing that you'll see on any page of the design standards are additional benefits. And these are exactly as they sound. They are 
additional benefits, not only to our future residents, but also neighbors. Um, because we at the Kelsey believe very strongly in community. And so um, these additional benefits are affordability because the other thing about the Kelsey is that if you take nothing else away from this talk, the Kelsey incentivizes affordable, accessible, and inclusive housing. So uh, affordability, racial equity, environmental sustainability, safety, and finally, better design. So um, this gives you the web link to be able to download the standards at the kelsey.org slash design. And this gives you a picture of the inclusive design standards, the book that I showed you earlier. And then um, the self-certification tool is on um, an Excel spreadsheet, um, both of which you can download at our website. And this is uh, an element detail sheet um, that I'll go through quickly. At each element has a number, a subcategory, and a name. And you might see highlighted where it says essential element. And that basically refers back to the certification process. There are some baseline elements that you have to have in order to be certified as a disability forward development. So that's what essential element means. And the one and then the two represent um two different levels of this element. And those points that you get added up are going to give you your final number for the self-certification process. And with impact areas and additional benefits, they will be bolded if they apply to the element that you're looking at. And finally, sources were just kind of where the idea for this element came from. So that is kind of an overview of the way that everything is laid out. Um, okay, like I said, this is really the design center 2.0. So I won't spend much time here, but um, <clears throat> Like I was talking about on the last side, we have essential elements that are kind of a baseline requirement. And then we have silver, gold, and platinum, which represent different tiers of self-certification. So you can see those totals and um, I highly encourage, if you're interested in the self-certification process, you can definitely reach out to me and email me your interest. Um, partner with us. So um, I don't know if it's mostly renters that are on the call or if this would matter to anyone, but we have... Um, something called committed firms, which are um, organizations that have basically agreed with us that these design standards are something that they support and want to help us amplify the message. And so I don't know if the Seattle would be interested, but um, if you want to be a committed firm, that is something else that I can help you out with and you can um, email me. The other thing is with public sector partners, 
we really want to incentivize affordable, accessible, and inclusive housing. And so we've worked with the city of San Jose in California and also the city of San Antonio in Texas. And with San Jose, one cool thing that happened is they put out a NOFA, which stands for Notice of Funds Available. They put out a NOFA saying that in order to qualify to build affordable housing in San Jose, you had to use some of the Kelsey's design standards. Okay, that is my cue that we have questions in five minutes. I think that I'm almost done. So it's really important to work with um, partners, um, you know, there in Seattle or in Washington State, um, because working with your local government partners is a big part of how our developments in San Jose and San Francisco happened. So I think I'm almost done. So ways to engage. We already talked about certification and how important it is that you provide feedback. Um, lastly, I wanna talk about sharing these design standards. So sharing them with your networks, professional groups, clients, funders and partners is very important in amplifying um, our message of the need for disability forward housing. And um, back to the statistics that we went over at the beginning, a little of that was to show you how big the problem really is and um, in no way will it just be one organization or one um, firm that is going to solve this problem. It's going to be all of us working together. Um, so it's important that you share. And that is it for me. I'd love to turn it over to questions if anyone had them. I'll ask a question what so, would you say what would you say has been one of the most difficult things um in uh getting um these these standards um implemented with developers and working with developers um well, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term NIMBYism, but everyone wants people with disabilities to be housed just on their neighborhood. <laughs> and so um, winning over, you know, the NIMBY folks has definitely been a big challenge because um, especially when you aim to have a mixed set of incomes in one building or one development, um, it's hard because it's not really the cash cow that is market rate buildings, you know? So I would say that that has been one of the hardest things. And I have a question for you. Can I can I go yeah. ahead? Um in terms of accessibility, how would you rate Seattle? Um, I think we may all have different answers in that. Um I, I see Cecilia's pen. hand. I bet Cece knows. <laughs> Why don't you take it away? This is our board president. Oh, okay. Hi. 
Um, well, I guess this is, I, I'm a wheelchair user. And so I'll just say finding an apartment is extraordinarily difficult. Um, it took me like nine months of, of emailing like a, at least a dozen brand new apartment buildings every month to try to find a, a apartment that was, um, you know, for mobility needs. And, um, but part of that was like, I really, it was really important for me to be near transit and we're building this light rail um, system and like finding apartments, find, yeah, finding apartments near, despite like all this building growth, like finding accessible apartments near a light rail is so difficult. And then like trying to find one that's affordable is, um, is pretty much impossible. Uh, and so I guess that was, it's kind of like my question for you is I know you said that these designs aren't, they're different from codes, mm. but you know, as like Seattle is building all these new buildings, we have the absolute minimum standards for, um, for developers to build accessible units. And um, so how like have cities or, or how does your advocacy um, try to like promote increase like uh, requirements for um, new buildings or, or how are you thinking about that if it's um, not codes? Yeah, I don't think that's a very succinct question, but. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, thank you for the question. I think that, like when I mentioned the NOPA that uh, the city of San Jose put out, it's really just about, um, because a lot of able-bodied people don't even consider accessibility when looking for a unit or a house. Um, so I think a big part of it is just telling our story to as many people will listen. Um, and the other thing about it is like going back to San Jose, um, not only telling them our mission and why it's why disability forward housing is so important, but also getting them to put their money where their mouth is and you know include incentives in getting local funding um, by making it necessary to use our design standards. So I think that that has been um, a big part of the developments that we have going on in California. Um, let me see. In Seattle? Am I saying it right? Regarding the question in Seattle, I work a lot with the elders, and it is very poor. It's, they're not even considered at all. So how extensive is your public transportation? Or is it all about this light rail? Public transit in Seattle is is like pretty terrible, uh, I think. I mean, I've lived in places where it's worse, but um, yeah, it's pretty bad. Like the escalators are always broken for the light rail and mm -hmm. elevators are hard to find if they exist at all. Um, and then the bus services are pretty awful. Like if you, you know, if you want to go to like a park, like one of like the, the bigger parks and like go for like a, a walk or a roll in the woods like with a wheelchair or something like those nicer parks like the buses don't go to most of them so like there's not even public transit to those places like the wealthier like I'm thinking like um like Magnuson and and some of the bigger nicer parks mm. Alexandria did you have a question or a comment Hi, Fatima. Uh, thank you. I was just going to say exactly what um, 
they spoke to about the elevators being broken and um, but as for housing, when people let me know about their housing issues over in Seattle, um, I do hear a lot about um, getting like uh, a lot of grief for wanting to do a reasonable accommodation or modification and then having to, of course, have to pay for the modification themselves, mm -hmm. which can be an issue. And then also having to deal with um, discrimination and, and having to um, connect with fair housing because of so much stigma on the um, accessibility. Right. Really the only benefit to our public transit system is that folks with disabilities can access a reduced fare permit that brings the cost of transit down to about a third of what it would be for the average user. Um, it's super useful and we're very grateful for it, but it's still a dollar a ride. It is not free. Yeah. All right. Fabra, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I um, Thank you, Fatima, for being here. I, I wondered um, if you have any suggestions for how to frame, maybe you kind of touched on this, but how to frame um, the incentive for building in these ways that are accessible for everyone, because it's not just you know, people with disabilities that benefit from this, you know, these kinds of, um, you know, just this form of building and aesthetics and stuff, because I'm thinking of, um, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Tequila. Um, it's like a, a city that's further south from Seattle that voted, I want to say in like the 2000s to not, um, I, I might be getting some of the details wrong on this, but it was, they voted against like a building code that would make apartments and homes more accessible and um and so then as that as like those people who voted that way in their 2000s have aged and like now they you know may be using wheelchairs or they just may not be able to like go up three flights of stairs or something and anyway I I don't know where I'm going with this but I'm just wondering like do you ever try to frame these things in in a way that it's going to benefit everyone regardless of their mobility and all of that. That was a great segue to something I should have talked about. Are you guys familiar with um, the curb cut effect? That's not okay. Yeah. Well, basically, um, the, you guys know what a curb cut is, right? Okay. So back 30 or 40 years ago, when they started to be a thing, they were, when people thought about the accessibility, they thought about white male wheelchair users. And that was pretty much, they kind of owned the accessibility space. And fast forward to today, Curb cuts can benefit um, somebody who's healing on crutches, uh, someone wheeling a suitcase to the airport, a mom with a stroller. And so the message is really that the Kelsey believes that when you design for accessibility, you end up benefiting everyone. And so it's not just the men, white men in wheelchairs that um, get to reap the benefits of curb cuts. Now it's everyone. So the idea that when you design, not specifically for people with disabilities, but make whatever you're building to be um, accessible to everyone to the greatest extent possible. Um, that is, is really the end goal. And so um, I feel like I had a thought and it went away. But yeah, that is the end goal that we're trying to benefit everyone, even if we start with people with disabilities. 
All right. Thank you so much, Fatima. Um, we'll have questions too at the end. And if Fatima does have to dip out, um, put your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that um she gets those questions and we can include the answers in our um email that goes out with the recording. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It was amazing. We appreciate you greatly. I have to go feed my dog. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. So our next speaker is Carly Hokey um, from the Northwest Universal Design Council. Carly is a Seattle-based interior designer who serves on the Northwest Universal Design Council. Um, her design business specializes in accessible and universal designs. She's an accredited interior design professional with over 15 years of hands-on experience. And her mission for supportive living was realized early in life when her grandmother's knee injury rendered the sunken family living room no longer an option to enjoy. Additional life experiences, including an opportunity to be a care assistant to a friend who uses a wheelchair, honed her desire and determination to focus on accessible solutions. Carly's insight and perspective about our built environment led her to engage in educating and inspiring others, seeking inclusive and accessible environments through universal design. So it is all yours, Carly. Thank you. This is a great movement. And I am so happy to be here to discuss these things with you tonight. I think, um, you know, where Fatima left off is a great segue as well to what I want to talk about. And that is inclusive design, design that is for everyone, um, not just specialized design. So what I want to do is get my screen ready to share with you guys. And I haven't done it on Zoom for a minute. So let me make sure I know how to do this to share just a specific screen and then presentation slideshow. Is that working? Do you guys see a slideshow? Good, thank you, wonderful. So um, yeah, this is very near and dear to my heart. And I wanna tell you guys that, um, that the Northwest Universal Design Council is on the same page as you guys and all for trying to get new facilities and even existing facilities that are being remodeled to be more inclusive and more accessible. So one thing that um, I mentioned to Tanya earlier is that cities are doing a comp plan. So I don't understand this fully, but we are as a council working to see what we can do to put our voices forward um, in the comp plan so that developers as they start to develop and look at building buildings that they know um, know the regulations or no more opportunities for inclusive design so that's something we're working on i know you guys have talked about that in the past as well so it will be great to be cohorts um as the comp plan moves forward and we all get a chance to kind of uh voice our opinions and speak for it so uh that's one thing and i hope today as i go through some images and some stories that something will speak to you that you'll relate to it and, and that you will feel like you can take something away and be empowered to make changes in your life and your environment in the city that we live in. So that is my hope. Um, so today I wanna discuss what is aging in place? This is a question that has come up, uh, Tanya, let me know. Question that has come up, especially for the elder renters group. And then also then what is universal design or inclusive design? And that is more of uh, the language that Fatima used is inclusive design, but really universal design, inclusive design is one and the same thing. And then I want to share with you solutions, things that you could do as renters, things that you could um, look for and want to be able to do to uh, create more functional and supportive spaces for yourselves. And I don't want it to be just to aging, like we said, it is to um, everyone. Curb cuts is a very great example of a solution that serves multiple people in different scenarios. So first off, we'll describe then what is aging in place. So the U.S. Centers for Disease Control 
has defined it as the ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently, independently, and comfortably, regardless of age, income, or ability level. And today I want to speak to home or what you call home, your apartment, your condo that you're renting, if it is a single family dwelling, and the safety, independence, and comfortability of that space. So why is it important? Um, for our aging adults, it's become a huge um, topic because of the high costs and the, the challenges of living in something that's an institutionalized home for older adults. And people increasingly want to be able to stay where they feel independent, familiarity, and security already. They don't want to be have to be forced out of those homes or those living places. Um, they like the connection that they have to support groups or community. Um, they don't want to have to be taken away from that. And then also, like I had said before, the high cost of institutional living. So that's why it's important that sequoids become a, a more of a buzz term. Um, and what we can speak to then is what we can do within our homes and environments to make them safer and better for us. Mostly, um, unfortunately, as you guys have stated, most of the living environments that we have were not designed um, for accessibility older adults, or honestly, the human condition, if you think about it, we are all humans um, with various stages of our lives um, and dealing with different um, abilities. Um, so too often, I want to say that we implement changes in our environment in a reactive way. Uh, we call this the Band-Aid approach. Uh, some of the things that people do to make a Band-Aid approach could definitely be reviewed and designed appropriately for a solution. For example, this picture shows um, some steps with a ramp next to it. And I don't know if you know any of you wheelchair users could speak to this ramp that is pretty crazy and steep going up to this house. But it looks like possibly, you know, they there was a stairway there, they cut it in half and they just threw a ramp up without much consideration of the functionality of a steep ramp or um or you know, if somebody using mobility equipment or somebody using a manual chair um, could even get up those. And I also want to say, Tanya, um, I can't see very well. Um, maybe I can change my screen, but uh, chats. So if anybody has comments or questions along the way, please jump in. I would rather this be more conversational. Absolutely. Okay. So universal design. So universal design is an approach that considers the diverse needs and abilities of all people. And our, really the basis is, is that our surroundings should be accessed and understood by everyone with different abilities, um, regardless of their age, their size, um, their cognitive understanding of a space. Um, so it should be simple. So that means it should just be good design. It doesn't have to be have a big old label besides that it should just be good in design and it's for everyone to begin with. Um, Fatima spoke to a little bit of the codes. So within the last 40 years, um, significant efforts have been made to really bring about more inclusion and accessibility in the environment, like the, the guidelines um, from the Americans with Disabilities Act. And they raise a lot of awareness, but they are more of, like she had said, the floor, not the ceiling. So not that they're bad. They're great that they've come along and there are um, really good guidelines that it sets for us. But really what universal and inclusive design is, it goes a little bit beyond that, a little bit higher level um, in order to make it uh, more inclusive. So these are the, the uh, principles that we use in universal design. And just for saving time, I won't go through every single description of each one, but these are the principles we use to evaluate an environment, a design, a product, technology, anything that says it's universal design. So we want it to have equi equitable use, be flexible in use, simple in and intuitive in use. It should have perceptible information. There should be a tolerance for error. It should require low physical effort. And there should be um, the size and space for appropriate use for um, anyone. And any questions on that, we can come back to that later as well. Um, I just wanted to show this picture. This is a, a home that has likely added this ramp later, 
um, people always are so worried about the stigma of having a ram out their front door. And what we really want to emphasize is that it can be integrated. It can be designed beautifully. I mean, this one isn't especially beautifully. Um, it could even be more integrated than this. But it is something that is necessary because if you think about anyone at all, whether you use a wheelchair or use a walker or not, um, imagine that you were walking home from the grocery store and rolled your ankle on a curb and you broke it. And suddenly you're on crutches or using one of the knee scooters. Can you imagine in the space that you live in now, being able to get into your house in the doorway? I mean, many of you would probably have multiple flights of stairs um, to manage. And it's just a huge consideration for when, you know, you're looking for housing. I know um, Cecilia spoke to that, that it's, there's not a lot out there. There really isn't. So this is a, a great example of a good design that has a no step entry. So this is a, a single family home and they've designed it with a wider door and then the no step entry. And then as well, they've designed instead of having, you know how the thresholds typically have a giant like hump in the middle or like a saddle. This one they've designed so that it has a ramp or kind of a slope that goes up the threshold. Now, ideally I'd love to see a zero zero threshold, but this is a low level that's still manageable um, typically. Another great feature to look forward to is the lever handle, and it's a really good solution. It can be unlocked and mani manipulated easily and help and an exercise that you can use um, that's called the closed fist principle is that you should not have to grasp hard or pinch or twist your wrist to open a door, um, function, use something else in your house, like open a drawer, to have to use functional um, things. And so the recommendation is that you could get around pretty well. If you walked around your house with a closed fist, you could test it out and see how well you can get through your home. Um, if you have a lot of knobs, you could look at opportunities for replacing those with lovers. Again, as renters, I know that that's a question for the landlord. Um, the other thing, too, is that have you ever thought of uh, two peepholes or two different heights in a doorway? Because this is great for a person that uses a wheelchair or somebody that's got a smaller stature. So another great option. And that's a safety feature. Honestly, if you can't see out the higher viewer to see who's at your door, then a lower viewer would be a great solution. Um, let's see, an ADA standard that we use a lot is um, the turning space, and that is really the intent behind it was a guideline to accommodate a turning space for a person using a wheelchair, but you can see in this slide how wide open and um, spacious this environment is that makes it easy for someone that's coming in with luggage, with a wheelchair, or um, even somebody who has a caregiver walking beside them while they're coming through in their walker. So this is a, a good example of a good design entryway where you can actually get into a space and have room to come in and close the door. These are some threshold solutions for when you don't have the option to uh, have a zero threshold. Um, there is a portable suitcase ramp, which a lot of people keep that makes it just easier if they're visiting friends. Um, they keep it in their car and take with them. You can rent those or buy them. And then there's also this rubber uh, ramp that is able to kind of create a bridge between a lower floor and a, and a threshold of a door. So you don't have that big jump going into a space. Sometimes in existing facilities, the doors are just barely, you know, two inches too narrow and really could be just a little wider but rather than having to modify the width of the door or the opening, you could use these offset or swing clear door hinges. And what they do is they take the thickness of that door and they swing it behind the jam. So it gives you just a couple more inches for width. This can help if, you know, if you've got a, um, a area where you're bringing, uh, I'm trying to say laundry, that's the word I was going for, laundry in and out of a space, you know, you're usually carrying a big bag and your elbows are constantly hitting just a couple more inches 
will give you a little more space to get through that doorway. I wanna talk about lighting. Uh, we'll get to kitchen in a minute, but to focus on lighting, um, lighting is a huge thing that a lot of people don't focus on for accessibility. Um, people that are not you know, fully blind, but partially blind can really be impacted strongly by the light, by the glare um, in a space. And so what we wanna do is create a space that has levels of lighting. This is a great example because there is, it looks like you can barely see at the top a um, skylight. There's the ambient light in the can lighting. There's task lighting in the um, under cabinet lighting over the counter. And so it's really great to create these levels of lighting so that you can be more safely supported while you're doing a task that requires focus. Um, but you also might want it to not be so glary and bright all the time. So those lights could be turned down or turned off. Uh, this is a good example of finishes too that I like to bring up in regards to the aging eye, as we age, are the lens of our eye yellows. And so we stop seeing con um, we stop seeing contrast in, in hues that are, um, or values that are the same. And so it's good to have a high contrast of materials. So for example, this has a countertop that is dark and a floor that is lighter, so that someone who ha has that, that yellowing of the lens, they can see more clearly the two horizontal surfaces and the differentiation between the two. Going on to kitchens, this, this has a great flow of space and so much open space. I know that a lot of kitchens these days, if you're in an apartment, they're tiny and they're what I like to call a one back kitchen, or they are big, but they have a giant island in the middle that just gets in the way of everything. So really having a space that is large and open where people can move around, come through, um, especially if you have mobility equipment you're using. Another thing to look for in um, apartments, if your refrigerator goes out and you have an opportunity for some kind of saying what kind of fridge is going in there, a side-by-side -side is really great. The doors swing open wider and it's easier to get an approach on those refrigerators and get up closer to the adjustable shelves and different things in the fridge. This one has a great feature of having the ice and the water on the outside door, um, which is of course, um, easy for everyone, a great solution um, for all users. And then another thing to point out about near a refrigerator, it helps a lot to have a counter space. So if you're pulling things from the fridge that you're gonna put in the microwave, then you have a place to sit them down um, rather than trying to like balance everything in your arms as you're going from one place to another in the kitchen. Work surfaces in a kitchen are really important. A lot of times the standard 36 inch high work surface is not comfortable for everyone, it really isn't. And so this uh, lower picture is showing the height um, of a 36 with probably a 34 on the left-hand side there, which is just a little bit more comfortable for someone who's seated using that surface as well as a smaller scale body um, type using that surface. And then on the upper um, left is a lot of kitchens are so small, um, those one back kitchens, where you could use works, you know, extra work surface anywhere. If we could add red cutting boards or, or uh, pull out trays, that really helps to just provide extra work surface as well as a place to set things down. This was a unit that I recently got to review. This was a um, public housing uh, facility that has public funding. And I actually was pleasantly surprised by this tiny little kitchen because they did have a cook cooktop that was close to the sink, which is a great feature to look for because as you're moving, filling a heavy pot with water, rather than having to walk across the huge kitchen to the you know cooktop, it's nice to just be able to slide it along the surface. Um, the controls, I mean, this is a tiny little you know 24 inch um, oven and cooktop, but the controls are at the front, which makes it easier to access. You're not having to reach over a hot pot that's boiling to modify the heat temperature. So that's safer. And then the other thing is um, knee clearance at the sink. Now this does not have knee clearance, as you can obviously see, uh, but it has the potential for knee clearance. And the reason is that they had selected a sink that had a drain that was towards the back of the sink. So that moves the plumbing back further for anybody that wants to get their knees under the sink. So that moves the plumbing back further first and then the sink was not too deep. 
So we really could, if, if this home needed an adaptation, they really could remove those um, doors and you could have some space for getting your knees up underneath it. I mean, who after a long day of Thanksgiving dinner doesn't have a pile of dishes and want to just be able to sit down to wash all those dishes? So I think that's a great feature um, to be added to, again, any home that would be make it more inclusive. Uh, we'll move on to the bathroom. This bathroom is a fun, um, fun and personal story for me. I got to work with a really great family. Um, it was a, a father, loving father who had an adult daughter with disability and uh, mobility challenges. And she wanted a bathroom where she could spend the time that she wanted to, to get ready and have um, the support that she needed. So it was a bathroom with a single vanity with a large tub in the middle. Of course, the toilet, the toilet in this photo is hiding behind the right hand side here. And then it also had a little tiny three by three shower, which made it impossible for her um, caregivers to help her to shower. It was really a tough situation. Um, and so what we did was we spent the time and that's what I wanted to share with you as well is that a lot of times there's off the shelf product or solutions that can help us make modifications. And sometimes more design and more thought really has to go into it to make it universal that each element needs to be considered with the person um, or the, uh, the user. Um, and it doesn't have to be specialized for this scenario. It was specialized, but it doesn't have to be specialized to make it more um, inclusive and, and universal. So what we ended up doing was we she selected the finishes that she liked. So we got to do that. And all these finishes are porcelain tile. So very cleanable, easy to clean. Um, they're not having to get down on their hands and knees and scrub things because that wouldn't be realistic. Um, and then also uh, finishes that provide some contrast. Like you can see, again, the countertop is in contrast with the flooring. Any comments or questions, thoughts? Okay, moving on to this next slide. Um, a lot of a lot of developers will say, well, it's got a walk-in shower. Why isn't that accessible? Um, and you can see the difference, right? Um, to be able to have to step over a curb to get into a shower, um, trying to do that with mobility equipment, those um, of course, the glass doors are a huge pet peeve of mine because they're just not safe. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, so curb versus curbless, a true curbless is that it has no, no threshold at all or no curb at all, as in the picture that's shown on the right. And then this, this picture on the right is also a great solution because it shows the toilet uh, right there with also, they're basically in a small bathroom, you see the open space of the shower to have open space at the toilet as well. So I think this is a really good um, example of making a smaller bathroom work. Um, in, in sharing the, the floor space or the clear floor space, we call it. Uh, speaking of toilets, uh, the, definitely the, um, the bidet has come a long way and people love their bidets. Um, so one thing that would be proactive that we, we recommend a lot is putting in, if there's a, if there's a bathroom renovation, something um, needs to be repaired anyway, put in an outlet near the toilet so that you can have um, a warm water bidet. Um, they also make these easy ones that are really great for a DIY installation and all it has to do is hook up to the water. You don't even have to hook it up to the um, have it be electrical, um, but also a great solution for uh, modifying your own apartment or rental facility. Um, real quick, Carly. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. Uh, Sabra Sabra made the comment that they get frustrated when people don't understand that some um, disabled people need a bath, not a shower. Mm -hmm. That's true enough. That's how that looks. And yeah. Okay. Are there example? Do you have an example in here of a tub or? How would you like I to don't have an example tubs? here of a tub. The um, rolling tubs. Yeah, tubs. I don't. So the roll, I mean the roll the walk-in tubs are not great. I would definitely not recommend walk-in tubs. Um, but as far as having an actual tub that you like get down and can soak in, um, I think you know the biggest solution for that, especially in um if you're thinking about a 
uh, apartment dwelling or multifamily dwelling is that that building should have multiple units that have various features and benefits and different things that hopefully, you know, you could um, get into those kind of units. Uh, we don't typically recommend it just because we're so focused on the mobility um, and being able to get in and out safely. Um, Sabre, I'd love to hear more if you're willing to share um, more of, of why it's required for having a tub. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think that what you recommended is great. Like if there, you know, some of the units can have that as an option. I think that I agree that that would be ideal. Um, like my my frustration is like I have like a pretty serious injury in both of my feet. And so like I could figure out an option, you know, with a shower situation. But like um, when I tell when like when I have to travel for work and I ask for like a you know, a hotel room with a tub, mm -hmm. like the staff never understand what I'm talking about. Cause I'm like, well, it's cause they'll say, oh, well, it's like wheelchair accessible. It has a, a shower. And I'm like, there are different, like, you know, their disability looks a lot of different ways. So anyway, and people just like the general public just like, doesn't understand that, I guess they're like, well, if it has a shower, it, you know, then, then it's good to go. And, and I don't know, kind of I just wish that our building codes were more nuanced and yeah. Mm -hmm. No, great point. I appreciate that. I mean, hospitality is interesting because they do have, uh, depending on, you know, occupancy for them, but they do have the flexibility to shift um, people around and, and be able to accommodate. So yeah, I would definitely look for that and advocate for that um, as well. Definitely. Um. I want to talk to grab bars in this space a little bit. So uh, a lot of people worry, a lot of um, landlords worry about a space looking very institutional once you add grab bars, but there are many um, different kinds to choose from, different colors, options. Not all grab bars are created equal. Uh, so you do want to make sure you're getting a grab bar, uh, not a, what they call a support rail or something else that's not a grab bar. Um, but in this scenario, um, we she really needed it because um, she had a hard time with with balance. Um, and so she really needed them everywhere. And we were able to add them at the right height location for her in a residential space when it's not um, necessarily called an accessible unit. Certain in hotels, especially, they have to have accessible units and they have to have grab bars set at certain heights to meet the ADA guidelines or the or the local code. Um, but in a residence, you don't. You can set them at the height that you need them. Um, and that's more specialized, but you can do that because there you can add backing um, and bracing to really anchor those grab bars where you need them. Um, so I do just want to recommend that anybody that's putting up grab bars, make sure they're in a location that actually suits you, um, not just going off some standard that speaks to kind of what Fatima was saying of the... Um, the American white man, right? <laughs> so, and his stature and his expected height. Um, and then with this, this unit, we were able to also put in a handheld um, shower unit, which is really great for better hygiene. Um, they have the glide bars. Now I like those glide bars to actually be a grab bar as well. So it's anchored into the wall well, just in case you do grab onto it, it's good and steady. And then the handheld can be lifted out and used um, as you need, whether you're seated, standing, um, to, to keep the best hygiene possible. Oh, and there's my arrows. Okay, the role of medical equipment. This is something, um, Sabra, with your question a little bit, um, was that a lot of people assume, well, if we've got a shower chair, then then you've got what you need if you don't have a shower or, like you said, if you've got um, specific needs. So medical equipment definitely has its role that is a great support. These are just a couple different ones that are good because they can go over the toilet and then also be taken into the shower. I certainly favor the one on wheels if you're in a scenario where you're not able to transfer too many times, multiple times, um, just for safety. You, you don't want to be doing that necessarily. So um, if you have a caregiver or someone helping you, you can basically get out of bed, get into the chair, go straight to the toilet, go in right into the shower, especially if it's a curbless shower. So these are great solutions. 
this shows really the contrast of different uh, vanities that we might have that um, the, the one on the left has the two different handles that set the water. So one of the universal design principles is that we don't need to cause fatigue or extra reaching for someone to have to go over that, that distance of the sink to have to adjust the water on both sides. It's far better to use a single, um, single lever faucet like here on the right. And then this also shows the uh, rear drain in the sink. So again, this is kind of set up in a good place that someone could possibly have knee space under that sink. Okay, I want to address also one other thing with uh, specific aging in place, but also um, to everyone is that the bedroom is, if you have the option of choosing a first level, of course, that's what you want to do. But if you're in a single family home um, and an injury occurs or someone is needing um, really to be cared for, um, really a first level bedroom is the best option, a first level bedroom or one that has a full bathroom is the best that you can get. So that would be something I would recommend to any um, anyone aging at home, that if they're living up on a second level, if they could possibly relocate, that will reduce the number of, uh, or the chances of fall at the stairs and the cause of fatigue. These are a couple of great solutions, you know, for a closet to be able to pull down a rod to you, to bring it down to a more of a reach range that's easier. Of course, if I was going into a, a unit to assess the closet, I would say, let's just put a rod at a lower height. That's a great solution as well. And then these floor to ceiling um, mounted poles are really good because they could be mounted anywhere. They could be by a, a bed as shown here, where you don't have a place for a grab bar or where a grab bar that's attached to the bed might not be as secure as you need it to be. It's better to have a pole that's mounted from the floor to the ceiling. And then also I've used these at reclining chairs so that people are able to get in and out of their chair a little bit easier. Laundry, laundry facilities are tricky. Certainly we want front loading washers and dryers. So if you're in a shared a facility that has a shared washer and dryer, um, if that request can be put in for a front mount, that's ideal. And also that the door swings wider so you can actually get up to and and uh, have that door out of the way for you to reach into the, the washer and dryer. And then just one other feature shown here that's good is as I had mentioned before, the controls at the front of the unit so that they're easy to get to and reach. Window features, don't we wanna always just let the light in when we can here in Seattle because it's so great. <laughs> um, there's a lot of different window treatments out there. Sometimes glare is a huge problem um, for people that um, might have an aging eye. So you wanna be able to have window treatments that have some flexibility. This shows kind of your standard um, blinds that has that twist crank that's really hard to be able to do that if you can't do that motion, that twist of the, that grasp and twist of the wrist. So there are better solutions that we can look at for that. There's some that have the hook. Um, there's some that can pull down if you have the use of both hands. Best truly is to have um, kind of a motorized unit that where it's either just a, a click of a button that raises and lowers the shades or a, um, or even just speaking to Alexa, having Alexa do it for you. That's always great too. And uh, then the other thing is with apartment units, a lot of times we see windows that are just impossible to open, that you can't even get the tiny little lever popped out and get everything lifted open. So another thing, I mean, that we would certainly advocate for is uh, windows that have a crank lever is easier to open um, or the large handles, but always setting them lower so that people can actually reach those rather than having them up high on the window. And then to end on a safety note is that uh, smoke alarms for people uh, who are hard of hearing really need to be visual, have a visual cue for people so that they don't miss that that smoke alarm is going off. So if you need that and don't have that, that is certainly something to advocate for yourself and get. Okay, that's it. This has been really just a great opportunity. I'm excited to hear more from um, the attorney as we go on, but does anyone have questions we can address now or feel free to email me with questions as well.
Saber, go ahead. Hi, sorry. I hope I'm not like dominating the conversation or not or like hogging the mic. So sorry. Um I, I did wonder if you had any like suggestions or insight about like about noise and like um specifically I'm thinking of like people with autism who have a lot of sound sensitivities and um yeah I, I don't know I just like yeah. I don't know no, if you have any thoughts about that yeah no that's a true no one rings that up very often it's true um so yes I've worked with a client recently who um specific sounds or tones definitely are bothersome um and and cause um can actually cause nerve pain for this person and so what we've tried to do in different scenarios and a lot of times it is trial and error for this is um to mitigate with um panels like sound panels that you can put up on walls and then as far as noise from other units that's super challenging because that needs to be done really structurally um with extra thickness of a wall and extra um um, I get thinking the word batting inside the wall. Um, so yeah, it is tricky. And then the other thing that we worked with too is to um play with a uh, little bit of uh, white noise to see if they could, if we could offset some of those triggers, some of those sounds with a, a background white noise. Thank but you. Definitely yeah, those are noise. yeah, those are such good suggestions. I also like going. I know this isn't something we can change overnight, but again, it's like something about building codes that I would love to see improved because you know part of the reason that I really enjoy living in older buildings is because the walls are a lot thicker and you know buildings built in like the 2000s are just paper thin yeah true that is a great point well those older buildings might have great sound it's all the other things that are tricky <laughs> door widths so or true. whatnot right <laughs> yeah so true <laughs> yeah anyone As else someone with as someone with sound sensitivity, I just wanted to mention in my rental, I chose to, hung, to hang quilts in the room that I needed the extra sound padding in. And it has worked wonders. So, yeah. Just, Good. Just saying. That's great. They're really pretty, D. Uh, both of them were made by a friend. Any other questions for Carly before we move on to Shane, who will give us some insight into the legal aspects? All right. All right. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Carly. We truly appreciate you. Thank you for sharing all your insight and your experiences in the divine sphere. Excuse me. Our next presenter is Shane Warner. Uh, Shane is a PM, is a tenant advocate and senior staff attorney with the Tenant Law Center. He joined the Tenant Law Center in 2021, has been advising and representing tenants in King County since 2018. So it is all yours, Shane. Take us away. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and I apologize for having just about the least inspired bio possible, uh, but uh, my name is Shane. I am a senior staff attorney with the Tenant Law Center, and let me fiddle with the technology here real quick, see if I can get my slides up. Um, while I am doing that, let's see. So we are a civil legal aid organization that provides free legal assistance to low-income renters in Seattle and King County. All right, is that does that look proper? Can someone confirm, does, are the slides up properly? Cool, all right, thank you. All right, so um, being mindful of time, this will be a really high level overview. Um, and it'll I'll probably get through it pretty quickly. What I wanted to cover tonight is just a quick pass through what are the relevant sources of law that establish the right to, um, generally speaking, right, be free from discrimination on the basis of disability and specific to this presentation to be entitled to the provision of 
a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification. And then um, I'd like to go over kind of what those are, what the difference is, um, who is entitled to an accommodation or a modification, and just some quick suggestions on how to make a request. And then if you do make a request and it gets denied, um, some ideas for agencies or organizations that um, you might look to for assistance. Um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to get myself sorted here. Um, okay. All right, there we go. Um, quick note before I dive in, right? This is just general legal information. It's not intended to be specific legal advice to anyone's situation, and it's not intended to create an attorney-client relationship between myself or the Tenant Law Center and anyone who is attending or might be watching it later. So that's the lawyer stuff out of the way. Where these um, rights come from, there's really three tiers, um, right? The federal, state, and local. In the case of Seattle, Seattle has its own ordinance that um, provides for the right to reasonable accommodation or modification. At the federal level, um, there are several um, statutes that could apply depending on what um, what type of tenancy you have or, or who your house, who your landlord is. Um, so depending on that, the um, Fair Housing Amendments Act, um, the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act may apply, um, the Fair Housing Act and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act could all apply to your tenancy depending on who your landlord is and if they get federal financial assistance. At the Washington state level, we have the Washington Law Against Discrimination or the WLAD, and then um, the city of Seattle has its open housing ordinance. So um, what is a reasonable accommodation? And this is pretty much pulled straight from the law, right? A reasonable accommodation is a change in the rules or the policies or um, practices and services of the landlord um, that may be necessary for an individual with a disability to have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy their dwelling. Um, so an example might be if a landlord has a policy of not assigning parking spaces, but an individual has a disability that requires them to be able to park closer to their unit, um, that would be a reasonable accommodation request, right? Because you're asking for the landlord to basically change the rules so that you have an equal opportunity to use and enjoy your dwelling. Um, another example might be in um, like the public housing or section eight, let's go with section eight. The section eight context, um, if a family has a two bedroom voucher, but there's a household member with a disability that requires uh, the household to keep significant medical equipment in the unit, um, it might be possible to ask for a larger voucher subsidy as a reasonable accommodation so that that family could rent a housing unit that is large enough to accommodate that, right? Essentially, that would have an extra bedroom for fit for that purpose. Um, that's a couple of quick examples of a reasonable accommodation. A reasonable modification is going to be anything that physically changes the space, right? That again is necessary for an individual with a disability to um, have full enjoyment of the premises. And I see we've got a question. So um, do you wanna just go ahead and ask? Um, yeah, thanks. I was wondering if those kinds of requests require you to have like SSI or something, or do you just need like, um, you know, a diagnosis from a doctor or something? Yeah, so I'll touch on that a, a little bit in terms of just suggestions for making the request. Um, there, it, there's no requirement that someone be on SSI. Um, you may need to um, submit verification from uh, kind of like you're saying a medical provider. Uh, particularly in cases where if if a disability is not obvious, um, just, you, you know, if it's not readily apparent, then then yes, the landlord probably could require verification. Um, I, if it's okay, I want to kind of put a pin in that and I'll circle back to it in just a minute. 
um, because I, I do I do touch on that in a slide or two. Um, so reasonable modification is a physical change. So you can kind of think of it as accommodation is when you require a change in the rules or the policies of the landlord. Modification is when you require a physical change to the space to be able to have full use of the premises. Um, that there is an exception to be mindful of um, in certain situations. Basically, the law just says where it's reasonable. Um, the landlord can condition their permission on the the renter agreeing to restore the premises to the original condition, not including reasonable wear and tear. So an example of that, I mean, I think a classic example of a modification would be installation of grab bars. An example of where the renter may be required to restore the unit would be if there's a sink with um, like an under sink cabinet that um, that renter requires removal of that for access to the sink, that would be a situation where the landlord can't prohibit the modification, but they might be able to condition their approval on the tenant agreeing to restore that cabinet at the end of the tenancy. Um, something important to remember with reasonable modifications is that unfortunately in most private landlord tenant situations, the tenant does bear the responsibility for paying for the modifications. Um, that changes though, when a landlord is receiving federal financial assistance, because in that scenario, that landlord is probably going to be subject to section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which does require the landlord to make those payments. And similarly, the landlord would bear the cost of restoring um, the premises as well at the end of the tenancy. So that would be if someone is living in public housing or um, if someone is in a unit with a unit-based subsidy, right? Basically, if, if, if federal money is going directly to that landlord to subsidize the tenancy, then the landlord bears the cost for the modification. Um, the exception being that if the modification is unduly financially or administratively burdensome, then the it's then it kind of falls out of the bounds of reasonable and the landlord is not required to allow it. However, this is supposed to be an interactive process between you and the landlord. Um, it's not something where they should just be denying it and shutting down the process right there. Um, there should be some back and forth with the landlord to work on an alternative accommodation that that might work for the renter. So that's the difference between accommodation versus modification. Um, next, I had planned to talk about who, so who is entitled to accommodation. Um, but, but now, <laughs> Sabra, I'm hoping that I, I can remember to highlight when I touch on kind of what you had asked about. That, okay, that, all right, I know, I know where that'll come up. So I got it. Um, so, you need to have a, qual a qualifying disability to be entitled to accommodation. That's going to be based off of the definitions in the law. Um, the, the federal law does not use the phrase disability. It uses a, a term that I think is fairly antiquated at this point, um, but it functionally is the same. So I'll, I'll use the term disability. Just be aware that the terminology changes between the federal law and the state law. Um, it, disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of a person's major life activities that, uh, or um, a record of having such an impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. Um, one thing to note about the federal law is there's a specific exemption written in there when it comes to um, use of or addiction to a controlled substance. Moving on to the state law, um, I think you'll see it's this, I included a lot of text here. I'm not going to go through all of it. This is to just kind of illustrate how expansive the definition of disability is under Washington state law and Seattle um, ordinance. The, the Seattle ordinance, as far as I can tell, basically just took the definition from the state law. It's structured a little differently, but the language is all the same. So Again, a disability is the presence of any physical, sensory, or mental impairment that is medically cognizable or diagnosable. Um, 
or that exists as a record or history, or that is perceived to exist, whether or not it actually exists in fact. And then the remainder of this slide kind of shows how this definition was really written to be as broad as possible, right? It, the, the state law goes on to say that a disability exists if it's temporary or permanent, if it's common or uncommon, if it's mitigated or unmitigated. So, um, and then there's also the definition for impairment, which is, um, if you'll note here again, this is pulled from the state law, it says includes, but is not limited to. So this is not an exhaustive list. I think it just goes to show how expansively the Washington law against discrimination and Seattle's open housing ordinance have defined um, disability to hopefully right, secure that right to accommodation or modification for as many individuals as possible. Um, so that gets us to just some suggestions for how do you go about making a request uh, for accommodation? So there's no, in terms of the text of the law, there's no um, specific language that a tenant is required to invoke. There's no specific form um, that is required. This, These are just some suggestions. Um, I would always suggest submitting the request in writing. And it, there's kind of two things that you want to identify in order to fit with that language of the law to show that you do have a right to this accommodation, right? And that's one, identifying what the necessary accommodation or modification is. And two, explaining how your disability is connected to the need for that accommodation or modification. And this kind of, I think, gets back to the question earlier. Um, the landlord is restricted in the information that they can demand that you produce, right? The, it's, it's not appropriate for a landlord to be asking invasive questions or demanding a specific diagnosis or proof of a specific diagnosis, but they can ask for verification that a disability exists, right? So that could come in the form of a um, letter from a medical provider, right? Essentially just confirming that you receive care for a disabling condition and require a, a modification or an accommodation in order to access and use your, your rental unit. Um, and feel free to ask a follow-up. I, I think that kind of was another element of your question there. Um, you, you shouldn't be required to produce something from a doctor or provider that gives a specific diagnosis, but it it would be within the bounds of what is allowable for the landlord to require verification, right? Just verification that you're receiving treatment for a disability, um, especially in cases where the disability might not be um, obvious at first glance. Um, and then if you are a renter in public housing or in a, a rent subsidized unit or, or even um, like a low-income housing tax credit unit, it, you might also try asking if there's a, a form that your landlord has. Um, um, okay, yeah, yeah, I see your follow-up there. Um, I will circle back to that. And then a, another option might be um, the Fair Housing Center of Washington. They advertise assistance with... Um, submitting reasonable accommodation requests. So if you think that this is a process that you might struggle with, I think it'd be worth reaching out to them. Um, so, and I have their, their contact information on this next slide here. Uh, so let's say um, you do make a request and that request is denied. To me, the heart of reasonable accommodation request or reasonable modification request is this is a discrimination issue, right? That's just how the law is, is written. It's by definition, a, a failure on the part of the landlord to provide a reasonable accommodation when it's necessary or reasonable modification when it's necessary for that individual to use and enjoy their dwelling. I mean, the, that, that refusal to provide that is, is unlawful discrimination on the basis of disability. So if you are a, uh, a renter in public housing or a um, federally subsidized housing, right, it could be a, a, a low-income housing provider that gets 
um, direct subsidies from the federal government to provide unit-based subsidies, right? If that is your situation, then you could file a complaint with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, a note here, when I reference um, individuals with Section 8 vouchers, the interplay there is a little nuanced because obviously in that scenario, you're renting from a private landlord um, and getting the subsidy from the public housing authority. Um, so in, for example, a modification scenario that the private landlord may not be required to actually pay for the modifications, but those laws would apply as to the housing authority, right? And their um, administration of your voucher and then, you know, their treatment of you. So I just wanted to make a quick note of that. Um, and then at the state level, um, Yeah, so I, I see your question. Um, I will, do you mind if I circle back to that in, in, in just a moment? Yeah, of course. Sorry, Shane, for having so many questions. I don't want to derail you. No, no, no worries at all. Um, so, and, and you know, I only have actually a couple more slides. Like I said, it's a very kind of abbreviated presentation. Um, at the Washington state level, we have the Human Rights Commission um, and then the city of Seattle has the Office for Civil Rights. So at the Human Rights Commission, um, obviously is tied into the Washington Law Against Discrimination and then the Office for Civil Rights. Um, my understanding is they can investigate violations of that open housing ordinance, right? Anything in the, the city code that applies to civil rights. And then this slide also has the information for the Fair Housing Center of Washington. Um, if you are looking for landlord tenant legal assistance in King County. I just kind of want to close with um, a quick rundown of sort of the main civil legal aid organizations that work in this space. So obviously there's us, the Tenant Law Center. The best way to contact us is we operate in partnership with the Housing Justice Project a, and the Tenants Union. Um, we run a tenant resource hotline. Um, we have staff on that hotline Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and then the Housing Justice Project, they are the primary provider of what we call right to counsel services in King County. Um, so they can provide assistance only in um, cases where the tenant is is actively being sued for eviction. But if, if that is your situation and if you do qualify as what the law calls an indigent tenant, then you have the right to be represented in the eviction lawsuit. And Housing Justice Project is the organization that provides that representation. Um, and then there's also for uh, residents of Eastside, if, if any happen to see this, there's Eastside Legal Assistance Program. Um, and then finally, Northwest Justice Project. Um, those are kind of the, the main civil legal aid organizations operating in King County. So um, that was, I understand that was very quick, but I'm, I'm happy to circle back to these questions and, and address any others um, with the time that we have remaining or also Tanya, if you need to cut me off, you're welcome to. Um, I think we have time for a couple of the questions. One of the ones, I don't know if you saw, an individual asked, would each city in Washington have their own open housing ordinance reference or is it just yeah. depend? Not, not as far as I know. It, it's very, it, it can be very specific to the location. And, and unfortunately, I, I do do most of my work these days. Um, it kind of focused geographically on Seattle, so I might not be totally up to date. But I, I will say King County in general, um, over the last few years, we've had a lot of cities that have kind of stepped up or tried to step up in, in certain areas to bolster their specific landlord tenant laws. So it absolutely would be worth looking into, you know, if you're a renter outside of Seattle, looking into, you know, what what your city might have on the books. But um, I'm I'm not aware off the top of my head of any other cities that have similar provisions where 
it, it seems to me like Seattle essentially took the discrimination protections from the state law and said, okay, we're going to put this in our code too. And we're going to have an agency that can enforce this. And, and I don't know of, of any other cities that, that have that. Um, so. And then the other one that was um, the federal exemption about drug use um, for disability. Is that past drug use or is that current? Yeah, that um, that's a good question. So I will say um, this was something I wanted to put in there just to kind of note. It's not a specific issue that I have had direct practice experience with, but just kind of, I guess, jumping to conclusions based off of the statute as I read it, right? And, and there's a massive caveat there in that I don't know off the top of my head how courts have interpreted this, especially because we're talking about a federal law. So you've got mm -hmm. 50 different states where potentially courts may have applied this, this law. But the way I read it to, to the way I read it is essentially that if your need for accommodation is tied to um, use of a controlled substance and the, the statute says illegal use of um or addiction to a controlled substance, then um, that is not something the landlord is required to comply with. Um, I I will note very quickly though that that doesn't mean that the state and the local laws don't apply, right? And and the state law doesn't have that exception in it. Um, so, um, go ahead, Sarba. I know I'm like getting so in the weeds. So tell me if this is too um, too specific, but that federal statute, I'm assuming that that is part of like what prohibits HUD from providing like housing first and things like that. Or, or is that a much longer conversation than we have time for? No, that's really interesting. And it's, I think what it is really is it's outside of my, my scope of knowledge. So <laughs> I'm sorry to fall short there. Um, no worries. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I did see you had a another question there about retaliation. Um, I I think that is um, an interesting question, and that is also something um, that arguably is touched on in the um, the city of Seattle code. Unfortunately, at least my thinking, and I know the thinking of at least one of the other attorneys here, is that the, the Washington state laws regarding retaliation in the landlord-tenant context are not as strong as they could be. Um, the city of Seattle is a little bit better because um, they actually have an agency that can step in and enforce the city code. And the city code does prohibit um, a landlord from taking adverse actions against a tenant in retaliation um, to that tenant's, and this is just paraphrasing off the top of my head, but essentially their um, assertion of their rights or making a good faith complaint to the city um, regarding the landlord's conduct, right, in terms of, you know, that it violated the code. That agency is... Um, the City of Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, SDCI, had some trouble with that one. Um, so retaliation, I guess the short answer is retaliation is prohibited. And I think that you could tie it to if you make a reasonable accommodation request, that's a good faith assertion of your rights. And if the landlord turns around and says, I'm going to raise your rent, or if you receive a rent increase notice right after you make a request, I think that that should raise those retaliation alarm bells. And I do think that at that point, it would be worthwhile to um, contact SDCI and, and see if it's possible to have someone take a look at that notice and, and look into the situation. Unfortunately, I did not include their, their information on my slides, but um, I, I guess that's just to say that there are retaliation protections in the city code. And um, fortunately in Seattle, there is an agency that has the authority to enforce those codes. Um, we'll have in the renter's handbook that we put in the chat earlier, but also that goes out in email, that we'll have S 
SDCIS information. And um, D just put it in the chat for us. We're gonna um, close out. Uh, I know I'm mispronouncing your name every single time. Uh, is it Sabra or Sabra? Oh no, you've got it. Thank you, it's Sabra. Okay. Um, you can also reach out to our staff. Um, Kate at dseattle.org, um, myself, or D, um, D, if you'll type people's emails in the chat, um, that, you know, we can definitely hook you together and point you in a direction, um, as well. So, um, all right, we're going to finish up the night. Um, let me share the last section and then I'm going to hand it off to Kate to do our budget action. So it is all yours, Kate. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you to all of our incredible speakers. This was a, a really um, awesome and informative workshop. Um, so for folks who have been to our workshops before, you know that we always try to include some form of action to take, uh, to, to, fe to feel empowered and um, to make a difference after we've, you know, spent the last two hours uh, learning and feeling activated. And so earlier today, I was talking about how budget advocacy is so important um, in, in our work in, in, uh, it's really hard to get things done within the city. If, um, community organizations and, uh, folks doing the on the ground work don't have proper funding. Um, so, uh, the city council is working on the budget now. So this is an opportunity to voice your support about the things that are important to you. Um, B Seattle, we are, endorsers of the solidarity budget which um came together through a you know a, a coalition of of folks in the community who are really advocating for how to ensure that our communities are thriving and um the folks at the solidarity budget came came up with nine guarantees that are represented so it's a guaranteed basic income program housing transportation health communication, climate action and resilience, care, food, and living wage. Um, so uh, they put together uh, a, a sample script that you can use to give testimony, or you can send an email to council right now, which is what we're encouraging folks to do. So you have this like in the moment uh, opportunity and you can use the text from, from their, um, their toolkit. Uh, Oh, it looks like the links are broken in the chat. So let me try to grab them again. Um, or you can write your own. This is this is entirely up to you. It's just a matter of of communicating what's important. Um, and like I said, you know, the the Seattle Rental Organizing Council has been working. Uh, oh gosh, my my laptop is is glitching. Um, has been working to get that tenant work group for the Office of Rental Housing Standards since the beginning of the year. And it looks like it's actually happening. And it happened because of showing up during during the first public hearing. Um, so please just take a couple seconds to read through. Why is this link not working? Dee, can you try dropping the links in the chat? <laughs> uh, oh, also, if you uh, are able, that QR code will take you to, the, to their toolkit as well. Um, but please just take a moment, let your voice be heard at the city, um, whatever is important to you. Um, and if you appreciated this workshop and you want to see Building Tenant Power workshops next year, um, let the city know. There, there's uh, there's funding outlined for, for tenant services, but uh, you know, it's 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 never enough because tenants are really struggling. And with that, oh, D, you did it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for coming. And um, thank you to our speakers. 
and uh hopefully we'll see you maybe in person at one of our uh renter council meetings or at the next budget hearing on november 13th all right joe have a good night thank you everyone thank you <clears throat> thank you great workshop thanks for coming everyone